animal fat is often described as the magic ingredient that makes meat smell and sizzle and taste so incredible. But how easy is it to grow it in a bioreactor? And is there a market for it? The problem with meat alternatives is that they don't taste good enough. And that's because they're missing the key ingredient that makes meat smell and sizzle and brown and taste amazing. That's fat. So the unmet need that we're solving for meat alternatives companies is the plant oils that they're using right now, things like coconut oil, which just aren't up to the task of making really satisfying meat alternatives for flexitarians. So we sell our cultivated fat as a B2B ingredient to meat alternatives companies. They mix it with their protein and they make finished products that finally look and cook and taste just as good as the real thing. I mean, do plant-based meat companies want to add sort of real animal fat to their products, you know, even if no animals were actually harmed in the process of making it? The vast majority of people who buy meat alternatives mm. are not vegans and vegetarians, yes. Yes. they're flexitarians. 90% mm -hmm. of Beyond Burger's sales are to flexitarians and reducitarians. Yeah. These are the people yeah. who care about their health, they care about mm -hmm. the taste of their meat, and yes, they care about the impact on the planet and on animals, but they're much less caught up on the technicalities of whether this is truly a vegan ingredient sure, sure. or not. Yeah. And in fact, to many people, the idea of a veggie burger is not an appetizing one. Yes. We don't want the association with an alternative yeah. because an alternative means a compromise. Communicating that to our plant-based customers can be a challenge because they're used to using plant-based ingredients. Their branding is heavily based around being entirely animal-free. But as consumers shift, so too do our B2B customers. Yeah. And that's becoming a very easy conversation for us to have. Okay, okay. But isn't it easier to make or to get microbes to produce sort of animal-like fats or maybe structure fats in other ways using, you know, microencapsulation or other technologies? The structure influences the way the fat melts, the way it cooks, the way it sizzles in the pan. And it's so key to have an encapsulated fat. So in our case, that's fat droplets inside cells, which are then kind of bound by a protein matrix inside a tissue. Compare that to coconut oil or fermented oils, which are refined oils. They're basically just suspensions of oil droplets in a liquid. That's why they're mostly liquid at room temperature compared to true fat, which is a solid or a semi-solid at room temperature, like ours. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get the structure right, it's mm -hmm. impossible to make, in particular, these high-value, high-margin structured meat alternatives. Think pork belly and bacon, not just sausages or yeah. burgers. And then the other part is the composition. The chemical composition is what gives you the flavor. And you have to do a lot of engineering, for example, to use yeast to make oils with the right composition. Mm -hmm. In our case, we grow the fat that you would eat uh, if you bought it in the butchers. And so the composition, the taste, is great right out of the box without any further engineering. If you look at the unit economics, how does growing cultivated fat compare to growing muscles? Do fat cells grow faster? Do they require different media? You know, how, do, how does it stack up from a unit economic perspective? I'm afraid we know this well as humans that fat grows faster than muscle does. <laughs> you can grow fat just fine staying at home, whereas to build muscle you need to go to the gym. And in a bioreactor it's almost the same thing. Growing, differentiating true muscle cells is a really interesting but really great scientific challenge. On the other hand, fat cells are, are much simpler to understand and much simpler to scale up. The other part of the unit economics piece is the way that fat gets used as an ingredient. It's a high impact, low inclusion ingredient. That's another way of saying that with a small amount of fat, you can make a really big difference yeah. to the finished product yeah. compared to muscle, where you typically need 80, 90% muscle by mass in the finished product. Compare that to only 10 to 20% for fat. So you spent a lot of time optimizing media formulations to get your cells to, you know, to grow as quickly as possible, high rates of differentiation, high levels of you know, fat accumulation. How are, you, how are you doing this? A significant part of our R&D team yeah. is mathematicians, software engineers, computational biologists. Yeah. This goes all the way back to me and my co-founder. I'm a biologist, but my co-founder, Ed, as well as being my oldest childhood friend, is also a mathematician and machine learning expert by background. So we build these exquisite machine learning models that allow us to optimize the entire buyer process for cost, scalability, and of course, taste. And one of the key ways in which we can do that is by optimizing our, our media. So it's using machine learning to do very high throughput experimentation in the lab, 
that creates data, that feeds into our machine learning models, and then feeds right back into the next set of media formulations than we test. So what about bioreactors? I understand you've also got some sort of IP around that area, sort of specialised bioreactors. What we do is we have a very small, high density, low risk, low cost modular reactor. And to produce more fat, we simply copy and paste. We have more of these reactors next to each other. They're very cheap to build. There's a lot less technical risk of scale up because we've already reached our maximum reactor size. And of course, there's a lot less lower risk as well. That means we can finance our scale up much more easily, always a challenge in biomanufacturing. And we can do our scale up much more gradually, which significantly reduces the capital risk that we face as a business. Running these reactors isn't straightforward. And we've been able to build really great hardware by building a world-class hardware development team but also building really great companion software to help us automate the reactors. The stem cells that we isolate are from subcutaneous fat tissue. So if they stayed inside the pig, they would have grown into the fat that we'd eat anyway. That means in the lab, they need very little uh, engineering or other manipulation to be fantastic for growing cultivated fat. Indeed, that's one of the big advantages of fat. It's easy to make. And also one of the big advantages of using adult stem cells. They're very close to being fat cells already. So they're easy to grow and differentiate. And the fat that they make is real physiological fat, almost indistinguishable from the real thing. We do immortalize our cells. Yeah. That's an essential step for making cell lines. And we can either do that spontaneously, right. in which case there's no engineering, yeah. or we can use really exquisite targeted genome engineering in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The real uh, opportunity mm -hmm. for genome engineering as a technology mm -hmm. when it comes to cultivated meat in general and cultivated fat specifically is for customizing the product. Mm -hmm. Another big advantage of our machine learning models mm -hmm. is that it help, they help us predict ways of engineering our cells to customize for specific properties of you the You mean like different product. melting points or? Melting yeah. points. We can come up with tastes that nature hasn't right. invented yet. Yeah. We can introduce um, omega-3s or other healthier fatty acids into the fat. Or indeed, we can reduce the saturated fat content without lowering the melting temperature. In three short years, we've grown to a team of 40 people. And most excitingly, uh, nine months ago in central London opened the UK's first cultivated fat pilot facility. It's a 1,000 litre facility where next year we'll be making hundreds of kilograms of fat and hundreds of kilograms of fat makes tons of plant-based meat. We're in the process of submitting our regulatory dossiers in the US and Singapore, our first two target markets, and we have a really experienced team for getting regulatory approval in those markets. That means I expect we'll receive approval late 2025, early 2026, which will be when we're maxed out at pilot scale and ready to build our industrial scale facility and really go to market with our B2B customers in a massive way.